We are just about ready to go. Just about ready to go. All right. So we're going to get started now. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this virtual town hall and conversation on marijuana in Florida. We'll get started here with a brief introduction from each participant. So starting with Commissioner Freed, if you could each just take a minute and introduce yourselves. Well, first of all, thank you for everybody who's joining on Facebook Live. And most importantly, uh, thank you to our bipartisan panel talking about this important issue of how we move our, our state forward. I'm Nikki Freed. I'm Florida's 12th Commissioner of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Uh, and this is something that I ran on, uh, something that I have been involved in the industry uh, really quite back when I was in the public defender's office and, and saw just the injustice of so many of my clients being arrested um, for, for the, the quote unquote smell of cannabis and then that created the probable cause. And so really just saw that the inequality in, in the industry um, way back in the way, a day and then was involved um, after legalization of, of uh, THC for low THC for our patients came into the state. Uh, and then I ran on it on an expansion of access to medical marijuana. This is something that has always been a, a bipartisan issue um, and, you know, really, you know, thankful to Senator Brennan's leadership consistently on, on it. And I'm just happy to be here today. Who jumps in next? Anyone, anyone who wants to. I'll defer to the senator. No, go ahead, Carlos. Okay, all right, fine. Uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. I am State Representative Carlos Guillermo Smith, and I'm very honored to be uh, joining everyone for this very important conversation on cannabis reform. A little bit about me. I represent House District 49 in the Florida House. That's East Orlando. That's the UCF area of Orange County. I was elected in 2016. And every session uh, that I have been here as a public servant in the Florida legislature, we've been um, pushing uh, to certainly reform Florida's cannabis laws, whether uh, it had to do with fully decriminalizing cannabis laws so that folks are no longer uh, arrested for misdemeanor level cannabis possession or it is a fully legalizing cannabis for responsible adult use, like I'm doing this, uh, this session. We're advocating for that through bipartisan legislation with Senator Jeff Brandis, or whether it's improving our state's existing medical cannabis program, uh, creating more access and affordability. Uh, we've tried to champion these issues in the Florida legislature, and I'm really proud to be a part of today's discussion. Great, and I guess I'll I'll jump in then, and uh, and uh, appreciate being asked to come on and talk about this important topic. Florida has essentially created, you know, we've been working on this topic for the last seven, six or seven years, uh, on a bipartisan basis. Originally starting with medical cannabis, uh, getting that passed through the legislature, and then obviously we had the statewide ballot initiative as well, and and then uh, added the smokables a couple of years ago to what what. Florida has as far as its industry. But the simple truth is Florida has essentially created a cartel of medical cannabis operators. Uh, originally, it was, you know, a handful of families that you had to be part of the nursery guild. Uh, unfortunately, there was not one African American that was part of that nursery guild originally. And so no African Americans were able to get an initial license. Uh, and even today, I don't know, I don't believe that there's truly any license for any person uh, uh, who's an African American in state. Uh, so we have prohibited small businesses from being involved in the cannabis world. And we have essentially through vertical integration created a system where you have to be a major corporation in order to even access the market for cannabis. So you have to own the grow, you have to own the processing, you have to own the uh, retail facility. And then if you're going to do delivery, you have to own the delivery mechanism. But this, the simple truth is it doesn't need to be that way. Most states don't operate in a total vertically integrated space. And we, we should allow small businesses to participate in this, what is a multi, going to be a multi-billion dollar uh, market here in Florida. And today they can't. Uh, in fact, we have people who have gotten licenses, uh, have essentially lied to the state in order to get them saying that they were going to grow in Florida and they were gonna create these businesses in Florida. And then essentially uh, decided that they chose not to grow in Florida and they were going to simply just try to sell the, the license to an, another out-of-state corporation. And so 
they got the license for a few hundred thousand dollars uh, of lobbying and payments to the state. And now they're trying to sell it for 30 or $40 million uh, to, to major corporations who then need another 30 or $40 million in order to establish themselves as a business in the state. So what we've done is created a cartel that is driving prices higher, that is limiting access uh, and, and limiting patient choice. Um, because these retail facilities can't sell to one another, we're often running out of product, there, uh, which is forcing people to change providers because you know company A can't sell company B's product. So we have a lot of problems with consistency. We, we, we have a lot of problems with just access. And, and frankly, because there's a, a basically an oligopoly, you have pricing pressures on these um, that the companies can apply because there's not a lot of competition. So I'm excited to talk about expanding uh, both medical and uh, adult use. It's something I believe it's not a question of if it's coming to Florida, it's a question of when it's coming to Florida and how it's coming to Florida. Most states have done it via constitutional amendment. That's probably the most likely path for it to occur in Florida, uh, whether it's one that's on the ballot in 22, hopefully will be on the ballot in 22 or in 24 or, or the out years. Um, I can't see Florida not having adult use by 2024. I just think it's gonna happen. Uh, and what Representative Smith and I have been working on is creating a legislative pathway to do that. We think that there's, that's the appropriate way to handle this is through the legislature. And frankly, I just don't want the legislature to say, ha have the opportunity to say, we never had a chance to talk about this because we are giving them an absolute opportunity to have this run through committees, to have this done the right way uh, and, and have people have a, a say. So it's not a take it or leave it choice, which is what the constitutional amendments are. They're, they're a kind of one size fits all, take it or leave it uh, opportunity for you to vote on something. And sometimes that's appropriate. But I think when you're talking about a major policy area like cannabis, the best way to do it, the right way to do it, is to run it through the Florida legislature. So I look forward to the questions we discuss this further. And thank you, of course, I am Bobby Powell Jr., State Senator representing Palm Beach County. I am Senate District 30. I'm also uh, blessed to be the chairman of the Florida Legislative Black Caucus and serving this year as the Senate Minority Pro Temp. Uh, I, of course, I'm glad to join my colleagues with regard to this robust conversation uh, centered on um, medical marijuana and per perhaps, as Senator Brandon said, uh, adult use of marijuana. I have, of course, been involved with this uh, since it's actually come through the legislature as a member of the House uh, when we, we started with a very, very low THC form of uh, marijuana and, and then came into the Senate. I originally sat on the committee that this piece of legislation was being shaped through as it passed on the uh, ballot initiative. Of course, I've been involved with uh, Minorities for Medical Marijuana Use, um, Ross McCarthy, a number of other groups, the Black Farmers have uh, been in contact with me. And to this day, we, we realize and recognize that still the Black Farmers do not have access to a, a license, which is pretty sad considering the state of Florida and the diversity of the state. We talk about uh, 18 percent black population in a, a very Florida is a very very diverse state nowadays and anytime we're limiting or blocking access to minority communities or people of color is very very concerning Senator Brandis talked about vertical integration vertical integration is a major problem here in the state of Florida because it, it's also designed to really block people out you got to own the trucks in order to do the the um, distribution you own the fields own the buildings it's very difficult for someone or a, other than a very, very organized, structured corporate entity to have the type of resources to be able to do so. Uh, this year, of course, I'm looking at making sure that things are more fair and equitable as it comes and relates to medical marijuana use and the use of marijuana period here in the state of Florida. So I'm very, very glad to be a, a part of this conversation and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Freed, and thank you to my colleagues, both Carlos, uh, Representative Guillermo Smith, as well as uh, Senator Brandis. Thanks. Thanks, Senator. And thank you all for taking the time to be here with us today. We, I know you all are busy. Um, we'll begin this town hall with a couple of short open discussions on legislation currently filed this session, which could affect marijuana. Uh, then we'll take questions from the audience. So a quick reminder to our audience, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and we'll try to get to them at the end of the discussion. Um, we'll get started with HB 343 and SB 710. Uh, legislation that would make marijuana for adult use legal in Florida. 
uh, Senator Brandis and Rep Smith, since this is your legislation, uh, could one of you open the discussion with a brief overview of what it does? Happy to. Really, it's it's what we believe is the right pathway for adult use in Florida. We've looked around the, the country. We've tried to take the best practices of th those other states. Uh, we've worked with some of the national groups that work on marijuana policy for the states and try to come up with a piece of legislation that is reasonable and rational. Uh, and, and tries to, to think through many of the challenges that uh, kind of going into this green field of policy creates. And so while I'm sure there's many that are advocates that, that you know, will disagree with one part or another of the bill, broadly as a whole, we think this creates a system that one, allows for adult use, two, gets, a, gets away from the complete vertical integration models and lets small businesses participate at whatever way, where, whatever way they want doesn't say you can't be vertically integrated if you want to be if that's your business model go for it but it doesn't it doesn't require you to do that and it allows you to buy different types of licenses and then it allows for people to sell product to one another uh, and then it sets kind of the minimum amount of marijuana you can possess on you at the same amount as uh, what we allow for medical cannabis which is two and a half ounces so that's a general overview of the bill i don't know if you have anything else uh, representative smith you're on mute. It's the word of 2020 is you're on mute. Right. Like I've never done a Zoom before. Thank you, Senator Brandis. So um, what I would add to what Senator Brandis has shared with us today is that this is bipartisan legislation. That's really, really important in 2021 in the Florida legislature because the reality, the political reality of reforming cannabis in Florida and in legalizing cannabis for responsible adult use is we absolutely must have Republican support to make this happen legislatively. So why does that make our legislation uh, the way to go? That's House Bill 343 and Senate Bill 710. Well, because this is a uh, very practical and pragmatic approach for a conservative legislature. It doesn't have everything that necessarily I would be advocating for if we had the opportunity to do everything that we want in adult use. For example, uh, we only have a study in our legislation for home grow. We don't have a, which is really just a pathway to home grow, honestly, but we don't have that right out of the gate. We believe very strongly that home grow in this legislature, unfortunately, would be a non-starter. And we don't want that to get in the way of us being able to legalize cannabis legislatively. We're also taking down, of course, as Senator Brandis was talking about, the vertical integration requirement, which keeps our small businesses out of the medical cannabis industry. Uh, of course, that has kept out not only small businesses, but minority owned businesses as well. And so, you know, getting into the weeds on policy here, I think that those people who understand uh, the important steps that would be necessary for us to not only legalize cannabis in a fair and equitable way, but also to allow so many small business owners to be able to engage, this is really uh, the way to go. And the taxation piece is also important. While we certainly have a budget deficit that has been made, uh, that has been alleviated substantially thanks to President Biden's American Rescue Package, what we're not doing is we're not excessively taxing this product. We're just calling for a sales tax on the um, purchase of cannabis for adult use as opposed to an excise tax. And we think that that is going to create really the bipartisan support needed to be able to move legislation like this forward. And for those of you who haven't already done so, it's important for me to make this pitch. Email or reach out, contact your state senator and your state representative and tell them to please co-sponsor Senate Bill 710 if they're in the state Senate or co-sponsor House Bill 343 if they're in the state house. We need to show that bipartisan support behind this legislation in order to move it forward. Uh, Senator Powell or Commissioner Freed, did either of you wanna weigh in on uh, this legislation? 
I, I quickly will weigh in. I think that you guys have really done a, a bang up job as you always have on looking at all the different parameters um, and looking at all the different interests and, you know, to, to kind of sum it together is that vertical integration has got to go, you know, that and the companies themselves, if you really talk to them like behind closed doors, they'll agree with you because they, they, they are you're, you're asking one company to be experts in cultivation and manufacturing and research and distribution and, and retail. And, and that's just impossible. And so so they know that they're not doing it good. And so they would almost also be in favor of this. And we have so many people, I mean, I see this from you know, the CBD side and the hemp side, you know, that want to get involved in the cannabis production. So many of my farmers, you know, are itching to get involved in this. We've, you know, had some dramatic, you know, blows to the agriculture industry in the last 10 years, first from international trade agreements um, that have really hurt our, our farmers to weather conditions, uh, to citrus greening, and giving our farmers an alternative crop that can be be profitable. Not only it is great for our economy, but it keeps a lot of this land that is really great, better for conservation uh, here in agriculture and not to development. So there's all these different benefits to our state from the taxable aspects of it and, and not taxing it too much because we've learned that the bad lessons of the West Coast, that they tax it too much and really didn't allow that the market to flourish. And people kept saying in the illegal marketplace because it was too costly. So there's got to be that, that happy balance to bring in the capital necessary. And, and what it also does is that it doesn't destroy your bills don't destroy the medical program i think everybody agrees that even with an adult use program that we have to still have a robust medical program and a lot of my time has been spent trying to fix the medical program um, because there's i mean i can go on for days about all the problems in the medical side um, but the adult use side really gives an opportunity to decrease our, our cost for criminal justice for expungement bringing people back into society um, not cost for public defenders state attorneys our, our law enforcement um, it, it really it gets people who have been kind of left out of our community for, for generations an opportunity to succeed again. Um, and it, it decreased our healthcare costs. If you talk to any healthcare company, they'll tell you that their largest overhead costs are pharmaceutical drugs. They would love the opportunity to start getting your, their patients off of pharmaceutical drugs and onto the usage of, of cannabis. Um, and then of course, you know, with our, our deficit uh, and our budget, this is a win-win-win. Um, and it, it's it, there's no downsides that, that would ever overcome um, a smart regulatory framework uh, for adult use. And let's not forget that's a completely free market approach <laughs> when we take down vertical integration. I know that my Republican uh, colleague and friend, Senator Brandis, agrees free market is what's going to drive down the cost. When you have more competition and you have more businesses trying to enter the cannabis market, whether it's medical or for adult use, you're gonna see a reduction in out the door costs for either patients or consumers as well. And I just wanna jump in for two seconds before I think Senator Powell was about to jump in and to go off of what the black, what's happening with the black farmers. Um, this is atrocious. Uh, it's quite honestly, I, you know, and I probably shouldn't say this live, but I don't care. Um, I don't know why they didn't see what the front end, uh, that this was discriminatory on its face, that black farmers were never going to be given the opportunity to participate. Um, they were part of the Pickford law for, um, uh, lawsuit back in, you know, years ago that showed that there was discrimination from the USDA on giving out loans and access to money to buy land. And that's been proven. And, and we did the same thing to them here in the state of Florida and have not done enough to, to make, make it better. Uh, there is one license that has been dedicated to black farmers and uh, the Department of Health has yet to give out that license. So now we're looking at almost seven years into the program um, and the black farmers still don't have equal access. I, I think as of today, there's only one female CEO. Um, if that doesn't tell you what's going on in our state that of the 22 license holders, um, one is female and there are no minority leaders. And, and certainly if anybody knows any differently, you know, correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, but if that shows that the, that the program needs to be changed and knocked down um, just on its face, I, I don't know what does. And, and to piggyback off of what all of my colleagues have said, and when you think about this particular approach, you know, when we talk about equity, it, there has to be a social equity program, maybe something similar to what they've had in New York or Colorado. Or Look at Virginia. Look at Virginia stuff. Virginia, like if, if you haven't seen what they passed in Virginia, it is just the opposite. Not only 
you have to be part of like part of your application actually has to have somebody who has been criminally charged with marijuana possession or a family member that has like they are they are going to like the extreme. Um, we should take lessons from Virginia. So didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you said that, because when you think about that, there also needs to be some type of social justice approach as uh, Senator Brandis has been a leader in the Senate when it comes to a lot of these reforms related to um, our our correction system, there needs to be some type of reform approach to those people who have had some type of arrest with regard to low level mar marijuana offenses. And when we talk about medical marijuana, we're not looking in, in terms of at least for me, I don't want to see um, the adult use overtake uh, the medical use because the benefits that are there are necessary. But we also have to recognize and realize that uh, Commissioner Free, you talked about us being seven years into this. And if you're starting, even if a of the black farmers or a minority institution or company was to get inside of this right now, they're seven years behind. They, there's a limited number of customers that have access that these people or these entities already have started to access. And now they've got to play catch up. And when you've got to play catch up like that, I, I believe in the business world, it puts you at a huge, huge an extreme disadvantage in terms of ever being able to be viable. Now, there's still an opportunity, but we're, we're still continuing to burn the clock, burn time, and we need to see a, a social justice approach, a, a social equity approach, and there has to be something that we put in place through a policy type decision, or whether it be if we do a ballot initiative, we've got to do something to make sure that we right this ship before it's too late. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to move the discussion next to HB 1455, which is a pretty unpopular bill at the moment, the THC CAPS bill. Um, Commissioner Freed, could you open the discussion up by speaking a little bit about some of the problems with this bill? Absolutely. We're, I, I guess I'll start on, uh, there's no reason for it. Let, let's start off there. The legislature is supposed to do things to move things forward to, to solve problems or, or to do good. Uh, this goes just the opposite direction. You can't have the 510,000 you know, people that are on the registry today. Show me one who said, you know what? I smoked too much last night. We need to cap it. That just doesn't exist. And so what it's done is by putting this arbitrary cap on THC levels. There's no research that says 10% is better than 11% or 9%. It's, it's a completely arbitrary number. And what it would do is not only cause our, 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 our patients who need this uh, to go either buy more, which is a tax on our patients, or have to go back to the illegal market to get their products, which is the whole reason why we passed this to begin with. You know, uh, and, and then you're talking to the, the growers themselves. They don't have the genetics here in our state. So they would have to destroy all of their products that they're going to be for five here. So technically is illegal for them to transport it over state lines um, and then start all over again. And now you're talking years along the way to get the product back out to the patients. And again, what problem are we trying to solve? And I go back to, I've talked to so many patients across our, our state and our country that are using cannabis to relieve, their, the, relieve them of pain, of suffering, of getting them out of bed after chemo treatments, um, getting them back to a quality of life. And by capping this, you're telling them that they should go and find other sources of, for, for relief back onto opioids or other types of pharmaceutical drugs. And there is no medical necessity for what they're doing. Uh, and I, I think it's just a, it's the wrong message to our patients. And it's really not the direction that this legislature should be taking. And Commissioner, if I could just jump in here. Uh, over on the House side, I've been leading the charge in opposition to House Bill 1455, capping THC, because we know how terrible capping THC, what terrible of an impact it would have on our program. It would take a wrecking ball to our legal medical cannabis program. We know it's not based in science. The 10% cap is totally arbitrary. And to Commissioner Freed's point about the product, the naturally growing product uh, that we get here in Florida, even the staff analysis here in the Florida House acknowledged that the range of THC potency for a uh, whole flower cannabis in Florida is between 10% and 28%. 10% as if you're lucky. So basically what we're doing with this legislation, and I'm glad that it has essentially 
stalled in the Florida House and is hopefully not being heard in the Florida Senate, uh, is that this bill would ban whole flower cannabis. You would not be able to uh, grow cannabis at 10% THC or less, which is the intent. And if the outcome here of this legislation is banning whole flower cannabis and banning smokable cannabis, we have uh, all but reversed Governor DeSantis's first bill that he signed into law after he was elected governor, uh, which allowed for uh, access to whole flour and access to smokable product. I think that that reminder, gentle reminder to my Republican colleagues resonated. Uh, and hopefully that's why we're not seeing any more hearings on the THC cap here in the Florida House. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a dog of an issue uh, that, that politically, and it's, a, it's really a, a solution in search of a problem. Uh, to my knowledge, there isn't a, a major problem that exists today. We are, I, I don't know why this bill keeps getting filed other than, you know, there, there, I'm sure there are some groups that will, will take any win they could take, they could get to, to continue to hamper the access for individuals in Florida have medical products uh, like cannabis. And so, but, but I think when they look at the polling, they just see this is a dog of an issue and that's why it's stalled because nobody really wants to own it. Uh, and that's what I hope continues going forward. And if there's one more thing I could add, you know, the, the damage that these bills do, it's, it's not good enough to me as an advocate, and I'm sure our patients who are listening to this conversation agree, it's not good enough to me that hopefully the bill is dead, it's been stalled, and it's not going to go anywhere. The amount of energy and amount of space that House Bill 1455, the THC caps took up during this critical 2021 legislative session took away our opportunity to actually make improvements and fix the medical cannabis program that we have. We could have been uh, allowing for reciprocity of medical cannabis cards in Florida. We could have reduced the cost of the $75 uh, ID for caregivers and for patients. We could have added additional qualifying medical conditions like sickle cell and dependence on opiates as qualifying conditions to open up access and done other things to improve affordability and dissuade folks from returning to the illicit market. Unfortunately, we didn't. We had to take up all of our time and energy in opposing the THC caps, which I think is really unfortunate for the patients uh, in the state of Florida. And I'll say, keep in mind that when we start talking about THC caps, the idea that it puts limits on both the patient and the doctors in terms of, or their physicians in terms of individualized care and what a doctor has determined might be the best care for the patient. When we, who, as you've indicated, uh, or as my colleagues have indicated, have decided that we need to put caps, an arbitrary cap on um, what TAC can be in medical marijuana, it starts to cause and create more more problems uh, and that really doesn't work. It starts to really impinge upon the, or infringe upon the uh, rights of those who are seeking care. Remember, we're talking about medical use, medicine for people that's prescribed, that's very carefully looked at in, in terms of who gets access to it right now. And when you start talking about placing caps on the way a doctor or a physician is prescribing a medication, it's problematic because we as a legislature arbitrarily don't have medical licenses, at least for the most part. I know, um, I don't think there's any any doctors in the Senate, at least medical doctors. I'm not sure about the House, but for now, we don't have any doctors in the Senate who have a specific specialization in uh, the use of medical marijuana as a, as a um, healing mechanism, so. And, and I think it also goes back to even just a comparison. It's not like we're coming in there and the legislature's coming and be like, you know what, Tylenol's gotten too strong. We need to cut the, the amount that's in Tylenol. I mean, it, it's the most ludicrous thing in, in, in the entire world. And, and like, you know, I, I go back to this, this personal story. My mom was diagnosed with cancer and she had a year and a half worth of chemo right after my election. I would have done anything to make sure that she had the relief that she needed after chemo treatments and hearing her on the floor after a treatment, not able to get up and not wanting to have another chemo treatment, I would have done anything for her. 
And, and I think that that's, you know, so many of our patients are going through similar types of experiences. And those are the stories that got me motivated every single day to wake up and fight for our patients. And, and for them to, for, you know, for people who are pushing this issue, talk to the patients. They're the ones who, who we do what we do is to give them a better quality of life. And this is such a short-sighted piece of legislation. And on to the rep's point, you're right. There are so many other things that could have been taken up the airways during this session. And this became one of the top things to be discussed on interviews that I've been asked about uh, of things that are going on. And it's just, uh, it's time to put this issue to bed and start moving the state forward, not back. All right, finally, we will move to SB 1820, uh, legislation to protect employees from unfair action on medical marijuana use. Uh, Senator Powell, could you get us started uh, what, what this bill does and why it's important? Absolutely. This is a piece of legislation that I filed, which would create uh, the Medical Marijuana po Public Employee Protection Act, which would then safeguard employees and the employer when it comes to the use of medical marijuana. A couple of things that it does. Um, adverse personnel action. It prohibits an employer from taking adverse personnel actions against a medical marijuana patient, uh, which means just because someone's a medical marijuana patient doesn't mean they can just easily be fired or fired because you know they are a patient or they have a card. Uh, it prevents someone from refusing to hire a or employ someone who's a medical marijuana patient, discharge or demote just because they're a patient, uh, discriminate against a qualified candidate or applicant who is a medical marijuana patient. Um, it would also allow if someone is drug tested and they're found to have medical marijuana in their system or marijuana in their system and they are a patient, if they provide a doctor's note, it gives them the opportunity to provide a reason from the doctor of the positive results within a five-day window. Uh, it does not, there's some of the things that it doesn't do. It does not um, stop an employee or an employer from being able to take action if someone is visibly um, under the influence, meaning that you know you're a patient and you come to work um, visibly under the influence of medical marijuana and you cannot perform your job duties. That does not prevent them from taking action there. But it also still creates these safeguards that are put in place if someone is a medical marijuana patient and to prevent them from being discriminated against or, or demoted or fired just because they have the ability to use medical marijuana. Uh, the bill also creates what we call the Medical Marijuana Testing Advisory Council. This is going to be established within the Department of Health to evaluate and advise the department on the ongoing marijuana testing uh, policies and standards related to that. And this advisory council is advised, I'm sorry, devised of a number of different people, including the Surgeon General. So I can get more into detail with that, but basically in a nutshell, this is designed to protect patients and employees who are um, prescribed medical marijuana. This is a great bill. <laughs> Oh, Talk about <laughs> let me just there. jump in. Right we there. just we just saw a teacher recently get fired um, in 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 Florida for for using medical cannabis uh, for no really other reason to my knowledge. I mean, I think that the school board didn't want to let her go, but they felt like they had to um, under federal law, which also needs to be changed. And hopefully, that's something this administration will take on is rescheduling medical uh, cannabis ge generally to allow it to have access to banking and allow us to have uh, a more straightforward access and frankly, allowing states to do what they do best, which is set the, set the laws for the, for the local constituents and, and the Floridians that live here. So I think it's an issue that needs to be addressed. I think it's one that, that is this gray area, but at least for state workers and, and teachers and things of that nature, we shouldn't penalize them for, for using a product that their physician says is medically reasonable and necessary. I don't know any other product we do. You know, if some teachers on opioids, we don't stop them and say, I'm sorry, you're on opioids, you can't teach her anymore. But we know that cannabis is much less harmful than opioids. And yet we're, we're gonna ban for somehow require teachers to, to leave uh, because of that. It doesn't make any sense. And so we need to fix that as well. 
Yep. And this is a piece of legislation that we've been working on um, with Senator Powell's office. It came out of, you know, a priority. We, we put together a green ribbon uh, panel when I first got elected and brought in uh, experts and doctors and patients and caregivers and veterans and everybody came together and you know said what are some of the biggest issues that we're seeing inside the medical marijuana program and this came out to be one of the biggest issues that's why we have been really supporting you know moving forward on on this part of it and we hosted last week um, a, a um, press conference with that teacher uh, and, and not only that but the union rep from from Brevard County uh, to talk through you know her experience and, and she was very clear on you know, she's not a pot, you know, she doesn't smoke during the day. Uh, you know, she takes 10 milligrams in the morning, 10 milligrams at night. Um, she was in a wheelchair before she got uh, onto cannabis. She was taking opioids and it made her loopy uh, during the day and, and teaching. So she had to get off of it and her doctor recommended cannabis. And so she has changed her quality of life and is actually um, running, which is just such a phenomenal thing. And just hearing these stories. And there was another individual down in Palm Beach County who was also let go. He worked for one of the local, uh, I think city, one of the cities, and he was in charge of IT and they let him go because he too tested positive for cannabis. Um, and it's something that's, you know, some, not only needs to be changed in our employment laws, but obviously the federal side. Um, I have testified uh, on a couple of occasions in some military justice uh, courts because they, somebody has been released from uh, their military service because they have tested positive for cannabis, even though they were just using CBD products. And, you know, seeing the, the test positive just because the CD products, CBD products were in their system. Um, this is something that we need to move the ball forward. Forward. Um, we don't ask people if they're alcoholics. Uh, we don't ask them if they're on other types of pain medications. Uh, this is a one of those parts of, of our system that we need to fix. But there's a lot of good people out there, and not only the ones that are using it. And, and I have this a, a very anecdotal story, and I know I, I see some people wanting to just get on um, that there is a woman who is inside of my department. Um, she's been experiencing a seizure since very early in life and was taking all of these medications and was still getting the seizures and um, really kind of really hurt the way that she, she functioned in work, but also in her family life. And when I got elected, um, she knew she had a little bit of a safe harbor and got herself onto medical cannabis. And it's gotten off of all of those other types of medications that she was on, um, hasn't had a seizure since, uh, is able to come to work, spend more time with her family. And so it's not only the people that are on cannabis, but those who want to get on it and are knowing that they can have a better quality of life getting off of the opioids, but concerned about seeing what's happening across the state of Florida and across the country too. And I also wrote a letter to the White House about some of their federal policies. Um, because there's people that need to get onto the cannabis, but they're scared of retribution from their employers, um, and we need to fix that. And one thing I'll add, Commissioner, and I'm so glad that you shared with us that real life story. I know we have mostly advocates who are with us who are listening to this conversation, but for those who are out there who are skeptical, who don't really understand the issue, I think it's important for us to educate those folks who have questions, because it's not just about you know, the cut and dry issue of access to medical cannabis is a constitutional right, and you shouldn't be discriminated against in the workplace. That is true. But also at the same time, what a lot of people don't understand is testing for THC uh, in someone's body is not an accurate test of whether or not they're under the influence of cannabis. In fact, it's totally inaccurate. There is no way of testing to see if someone has active THC in their system, active THC, meaning that they are currently under the influence of cannabis. We all know that if you use, if you use cannabis products with THC included in them, that that can remain in your system, not just for days, not just for weeks, but for possibly months. And so a positive test for THC is not what some people think it is. It is not a positive test for you being under the influence like you would think with a, uh, a, a drug alcohol test uh, when someone's pulled over on the side of the road. That is not the case, which is why it, what happened to this teacher in Brevard is so inherently unfair. She was terminated not for coming to work under the influence. She was terminated for having THC show up in her system during a drug test after an injury at work, which she had an explanation for. She was a legal, is a legal medical cannabis patient in the state. And unfortunately for Brevard County Schools, that wasn't 
uh, good enough. We, we can fix this uh, and we have legislation to do it. And I think it's incumbent upon the committee chairs who have this legislation uh, assigned to their committee to put it on the agenda for a full vote. And I think before we go off this and ask questions, I think part of it too, and this someone when I, the conversations that I've had with employers on it um, is the insurance side of things, the workers comp side and like the actual insurance for the companies that the insurance carriers require a drug-free workforce. And so that's kind of part of the issue. And so we got to figure out how one, um, these insurance companies take medical cannabis off of their list of that, what they're testing, you know, so I think it's even going further than just, you know, just the, the, the employers themselves, because some of them are, are in their own bind that if they are having to come, you know, have a work, a drug-free workforce in order to get, you know, a lower workers comp rate, um, then we got to talk to the insurance companies to get them to stop testing for cannabis and not allowing that to be a disqualifier for a drug-free workforce. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, now we'll move on to take some questions, um, starting with this one that we received on Twitter. Uh, anyone, I'll, I'll read the question. Anyone who wants to jump in and, and talk about it, feel free to. Uh, in Colorado, they're expecting significant regulations due to children gaining access to marijuana. Is this a parental issue or a marijuana policy issue? Well, first of all, I've not heard of this legislation. I would be uh, curious to hear what that is. But what we do know uh, about what has happened in Colorado and in some other states uh, is that we have seen a decline in the use of cannabis by minors after uh, the legalization of cannabis for adult use. You kind of have to think about that for a second and you're like, wait, really? States that have legalized cannabis for adult use have seen a decline in um, the use of cannabis by minors under the age of 18? Yes, that, that is what the statistics have shown us. And when you really think and try to understand how that has happened and why that has happened, well, when you legalize cannabis for adult use, it becomes less of a taboo uh, for young people. It becomes less of uh, you know, the thing that young people want to dare to engage in to piss off their parents uh, or to <laughs> rebel against the system. And it's just, it's just like I said, it's, it's less of a taboo. And we've seen, actually, uh, it's been harder for some minors to access cannabis once it's been legalized. Because rather than being able to get it from a friend, uh, it's now something that they would have to go, th go through uh, an official vendor for, which can be much more challenging. Uh, and that is not my way of sidestepping that question. I've not heard of that legislation. But I do know that the legislation that we've put forward for adult use with Senator Brandis uh, certainly is something that's for, uh, for uh, those 21 years of age and older for responsible adult use. And, and I think two on, and oh, Senator, go, go. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say as a parent for four kids, this is a parent's issue, not a, not a access issue. Parents are routinely locking up medication in their homes. This, they, should, they should treat this the same way. Um, you know, if, if my kids are older, I'd lock up all the alcohol too. Uh, it's the same, the same kind of logic goes for cannabis and alcohol in our, in our household. So, uh, you know, to me, this is just a responsibility of parents to be, to, to act like parents and, and do the responsible thing, uh, and not allow access to those types of products to their, to their, to their kids. So if kids are getting access, they're getting it through the parents because of the, the irresponsibility of the parents or the, ingenuity, or the ingenuity of the kids. <laughs> And I'm not very familiar with the legislation uh, that's happening in Colorado right now or the particular issue, but what I would recommend is that uh, it's not one either or, you know, it's a combination of both, whether it's parents or policy. I mean, policy wise, you got to make sure that we are putting together a more comprehensive approach in terms of education and, and you know, who's allowed to have medical marijuana and why and what the, what the results are and why someone under the age of 21 shouldn't have access. And then for um, parents, you know, as a Senator Brandon said, you know, recognizing that if this is a medicine that you are responsible for having in your, on your person or in your, in your place of residence, then you're responsible for making sure that you keep it safe because like any other medication, you don't want your kids to have access to it. And we've seen results of, and, and this is not medical marijuana, 
but because I've never seen, I, at least I haven't heard yet of someone overdosing from marijuana, but we've had overdoses from uh, different home medications that are in the, the you know, medic medicine cabinets in your parents' bathroom. So it's a, I would say it's a, a um, it's a conversation that needs to be centered a little bit on both. And, and I agree with all the comments and I think it's a, I don't know about the bill either, um, but the other reason why it goes down for, for under 18 is because we're getting rid of the illegal market. And so that there's less players in the illegal market when there's a robust actual legalization program. There, there's no money there because people are going and using it in a legal fashion. So they're, they're, you're shutting down the, the illegal operators um, when you actually have some type of legalization plan. But it is a combination of you know, your parents and, and teaching and putting in the way. And I've had this conversation with numerous people. You know, I, I, you lock it up. You know, it's very clear. And have the conversation. Again, it's not taboo. You know, I remember sitting at you know very young age and having the conversation with my parents about alcohol and and why to not drink and why not to drink and drive and I remember having those conversations with my parents at a young age and you have the same conversations with, with them on other cannabis usages I mean we all saw you know you all see the parties of the 90s where you know the kids are, are emptying out their parents you know medicine cabinets and I don't remember what they're called and everybody the fish bowls and everybody's taking them out of you know and so it's a matter of education and it not being taboo but it's also making sure that there are repercussions that it is 21 and up and the same thing on an, like an alcohol store. You got to walk in and you got to be 21 in order to be there. And if a somebody like an ABC or other liquor store sells to a, a minor, there are legal repercussions for that. And, and that's the same thing that you would do. On, and, and everybody I think needs to just get out of this idea of this taboo, um, you know, on, on cannabis. I think that we just need, it's prohibition. Prohibition came and went on alcohol and it's time to do the same thing on cannabis. I got a question here from the Florida Cannabis Action Network. Um, you know, uh, no legislation right now uh, says anything about home grow options. Uh, medically disadvantaged people need an adult use in order to offset the costs associated with the current program. Um, how does home grow fit into legalization in the future? Well, I think in the future, um, you're, you're gonna have home grow in Florida. Now, I don't think it's gonna be for a long time uh, or for at least a while. Uh, our, we, you know, we, we take the, the step of making a, doing a study on home grow. We think that's probably as far as we could push it through the legislature uh, because we don't think full home grow would, would be acceptable. I think another way we could handle it is just allow counties to do it on a county by county basis. I think you know, what you typically find is more rural counties will have more homegrown access than the urbanized counties if you look across the country at the states that have legalized. So, but I think it's an area where, where we could have a discussion on that, but it's probably a, you know, a 2024, 2026 beyond discussion before you're gonna really have one on home grow. And, and you should just legalize the market first and then, and then we can explore and, and expand into that. Well, and, and I'm so glad that the Florida Cannabis Action Network asked this question because for legislators on both sides of the aisle who are trying to understand why the insistence on home grow there's an insistence on home grow because we have an affordability issue with uh, our legal cannabis program right now. Uh, sure, I agree with Senator Brandis. It's probably going to take some time for us to, uh, first of all, enact uh, cannabis for legal adult use in the legislature, but also to include the home grow portion uh, is going to be a tough sell for this legislature. But in the meantime, the least that we can do until we get home grow is enact important policies to cut costs for patients, to uh, extend the life of the $75 medical cannabis ID card from one year uh, to much longer, something like six years, which is the life of a concealed carry permit in the state of Florida, also a constitutional right uh, in the state of Florida. We all understand and we know that. We need to do things like uh, cap costs uh, for doctor's visit for uh, cannabis consultations. We need to do so many things to make this more affordable to our patients, which really is the driving force behind the home grow movement. All right. Moving and on. I too. Oh. Just really quick on home grow. Um, I, I agree that, and I've said this publicly, like I have no issues with home grow. 
Um, I, I think that, you know, for those one, those patients that needed to make sure that it is as pure as possible. I know I was talking to Kathy Jordan earlier today and knowing how much she needed from medical necessity um, and, and to have being be able to home grow for herself. Uh, and so there are patients that need it. Um, but also, you know, my farmers are, are, you know, encourage it too. you know, the same thing I, you know, we can grow strawberries and peppers and, you know, anything in my backyard. Um, it, this is an, if this, if we are truly considering this an agricultural commodity and plant, um, then it should be treated as such. Uh, same thing that if, if anybody starts trying to sell, you know, the strawberries in your backyard, you know, over a certain price in, in the state of Florida, it's called a cottage industry and you got to get licensed from us. And I think the same thing on home grow, uh, we will get there. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, my, I encourage it, but you know, we're going to have to, unfortunately, we've got some, some hurdles to overcome in, in our legislature. Um, here's a question from the comments. I've seen a lot of questions and comments about, you know, equity and equality um, and the lack of people of color in uh, the marijuana business space in Florida. Uh, how do we ensure equity when moving forward on legalization for adult use? Well, I'm glad that you asked that question because uh, Senator Brandis brought it up earlier. Uh, Representative Smith has brought it up and also uh, Representative uh, not Representative, Commissioner Freed has brought it up, the idea that um, you involve um, minorities and Black people in the conversation with regard to uh, what Commissioner Freed said, the, what's happening in Virginia. What we've done in Florida is if anybody has had any charge related to marijuana has been um, in the correction system, they are immediately barred from participating well, the truth of the matter is some of the people who've had some type of a charge um, may be the ones who know a little bit more about um, growing or being involved in marijuana. I mean, you see where people have interrupted whole grow houses here in the state of Florida and have made arrests. And, and once these people have been arrested, they are now no longer a part of the conversation to be able to participate in this and it's quickly moving in the direction where it's not going to be illegal pretty soon at some point. But now we've given people the charge a criminal history, a felony that allow, that doesn't allow them to participate not only in the economy with regard to marijuana, but with the types of felonies they're getting in any part of the economy. Uh, we talked about the black farmers, the Pickford lawsuit. Still to this day, seven years later, nobody or no entity has that particular license. So the conversation, starting the conversation and talking has already been happening, but we need to see action here in the state of Florida. I've been involved with the minorities for medical mar marijuana use and it's continuous fight. It's a continuous uh, battle every day to make sure that we get equity here. And um, it, it just right now, it it's a struggle. It continues to be, but nobody's giving up on the fight. And you know, Black people, minorities have to be involved in the conversation every step of the way. I think the number one thing we can do to establish more equity in the system is to get rid of vertical integration. That is the major barrier. The fact that you have to have 50, 60, 80 million dollars in order to be in the business is just out, out of reach for most Floridians. Uh, and and what we, if we get rid of vertical integration, it won't cost that much to be a grower, a processor, uh, an individual retailer in the transportation side of the business. So allowing, breaking down those barriers and allowing that to occur is the number one thing because the market will react ap appropriately and you'll be able to get in at a much lower price point than having to raise 40 to $80 million in order to participate in the marijuana business in Florida. It's just out of reach for, for most individuals. Uh, and, and that will help everybody across the board. The second thing we can do is stop treating the, you know, the, the current law basically treats African-Americans like token from South Park. We have one. We have one single license in the entire state dedicated to one group. It doesn't make any sense to do that. It, 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 it's, 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 it's offensive to me that, that this is how we've chosen to deal with it. Like we'll give you one, but, but no more than one. Um, you know, African-Americans are 18% of the population. You know, can we just agree that if, if we're gonna have this restricted policy that at least 18% of the licenses need to be available? or something along those lines. But to me, let's not even have that portion of the conversation. Let's just get rid of vertical integration. Let's go to a market-based approach. And then let's let those who wanna participate in whatever level they want, 
get into that area of business. And we don't have to, and, and, and the equity will take care of itself once we get rid of vertical integration. And the prohibition. Yes. Well, and, and I agree too, uh, you know, as far as like breaking up the vertical and that certainly changes. And I think that's something else we need to look into. Well, one, one for, before I go there, uh, that, you know, every year the current license holders are supposed to be giving their diversity plan. And I can tell you that, you know, that the Department of Health, you know, it's a check in the box. Like, here's my plan. Well, what have you done with it? Have you actually effectuated it? Have you hired people? Have like, what, what is it? And I, so it needs to be a little bit more robust, even on that front on, on the current license holders. But, you know, the other thing and the other aspect that I have learned significantly just as commissioner of agriculture and talking to a lot of our minority farmers and seeing, you know, again, on the, on the Pickford lawsuit is the inequality in access to, to loans as well. That, you know, that even when we break up vertical, uh, a lot of these companies, a lot of these people are going to want to get small business loans and get access to capital and making sure that the banking system and the SBAs um, are going to be able to, to, to help them. Um, because it, unfortunately, this goes back to systemic issues in our country on access to capital. And, and we got to recognize that, that that is still going to be a, a hurdle, um, even if they're not trying to raise 50 million, but you know, even raising you know, 500,000 just to open up and, and get a lease and to start the businesses, sometimes it is an additional obstacle that, that needs to be overcome. All right, we are running kind of short on time here. So I'm going to move to the last question. Uh, what is the biggest hurdle to adult use in Florida actually becoming a reality? Well, I got one name, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Look, I mean, I think the courts could, the courts need to, to rule. They heard, had their oral arguments in May of last year. They, we need to have a ruling on this. It's been a year now uh, that we should, we should be able to, to know whether these, these, this is going to get on the ballot or not. Um, I think, I think we need to get, once we get that issue resolved, that many other issues will fall into place. Uh, and then I think if it actually does get on the ballot next year, then there's going to be a strong incentive to move it through the legislature in order to deal with it in a legislative format versus dealing with it in a constitutional format. So I, I think the key for us is not one person, but it's the, the justice of Supreme Court that need to make a decision on that ruling and move that. Um, if they've had their oral arguments, we're just waiting for a decision to come out on about two or three different medical cannabis cases. Uh, and adult use cases in Florida. Dare I say that partisan politics has in some way uh, been a, a obstacle to getting cannabis legalized in the state of Florida. Look, I applaud uh, Republican Senator Jeff Brandis for being here and being part of the conversation, but here's a couple observations. One, he's an outlier amongst his Republican colleagues, although I'd like to say that it's becoming less and less the case, but he's not an outlier uh, as far as being aligned with the, with the policy positions of Republican voters. Republican voters are overwhelmingly in support of cannabis reforms and in support of adult use legalization of cannabis in Florida. That's why we saw other states in the last, other red states in the last election cycle uh, actually legalized cannabis for adult use when they saw it on the ballot for their own constitutional amendment. So I would encourage um, my Republican colleagues uh, who feel this way to come out of the closet, so to speak, in favor of cannabis legalization because your constituents and your voters from both sides of the aisle will reward you. All right. That's a oh, difficult that's a question uh, for me. What I can tell you is uh, it, there's a lot of factors involved. It's not a particular person, uh, but people are involved and the courts are involved. Um, it's a more comprehensive and detailed answer than I'm, I'm ready to give right now. But what I can tell you is that there's also a stigmatism to the idea of marijuana and here in the state of Florida, there's an older population believes anything that is considered a drug is um, just negative in connotation. So it's a, a matter of changing attitudes and education. Absolutely. Um, well, that was our final question we have time for. Uh, thank you again to all of our participants for making time to join us today. And thank you to every member of the audience for tuning in. Thank, thank you for having us. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.